first we're going to cover today is poison hemlock and we have two presenters that will be discussing that particular topic both on the ID and toxicity side of things and that's Gatlin Button and Tim Evans. I get quite a few questions on this as well I'm sure everyone is this time of year and poison hemlock it's something that I probably have gotten one or two questions a week the last month on I didn't realize everyone else was but about half the time, usually people are confusing it with wild carrot. It is a very toxic plant, so there is a need to be concerned about it, even if it's just something else that you've confused it for. But we're going to go through what the differences are. The first is the smooth purple spotted stem, that picture on the top left. That is the biggest giveaway. There's no hairs on it, and it's very mottled and has this purple color. Whenever we're thinking, is this wild carrot or is this poison hemlock? that's what we need to look for first. Wild carrot won't have that. It's actually got a lot of fine hairs on it and it will always be green. Just like wild carrot though, poison hemlock is a biennial. So it has a rosette growth its first year. So that middle left picture is usually what we see at the end of our first year's worth of growth. And then the second year will be the picture on the right where we bolt and we send up flowers and that's when it gets pretty hard to control. The flowers that we can see on the bottom left, they look very similar to wild carrot, but they're generally smaller. They're an umbel, so they're a flat-topped flower made up of a lot of different smaller flowers, but usually we can tell the difference by, by that point in time, and we can always fall back on that purple spotted stem. Whenever we get that second year's growth, things get pretty hard to control. It's hard to control a, a thistle that's bolted. It's hard to control a poison hemlock that's bolted as well. And for that, we've got a few different options. Rosette applications are going to be the best, but most of those, if we've got Grazon PSD or Grazon Next, and if we include Remedy, that triclopyr component into it, we can get pretty good control. And that's going to be for a broadcast spray. If we're only doing a spot treatment, we have a lot more options because we're not worried about some of the other issues that we might have with that. Dr. Evans, would you like to take it for the toxicity portion? I'm Dr. Tim Evans. I'm the toxicology section head at, at the uh, Diagnostic Lab at the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. And the thing we need to realize is this plant is extremely toxic. The good news is, is generally when it's in its mature stages, it's generally not very palatable to most livestock. Most of the time, they're not going to go ahead and eat it unless for some reason, it gets incorporated into hay or forage or, or something like that. Then the animal no longer has a choice in the matter. It's going to go ahead and, and be able to consume it. When most likely the animal is going to consume the plant is going to be oftentimes, one, if it gets into hay or in the very immature stages of it where basically you see the parsley-like leaves and you don't see the umbiliferous flower yet at that point. There are two actual different types of intoxications that can be associated with poison hemlock. One is we can have what starts out as looking as tremors, excitation of the nervous system caused by compounds that are piperidine alkaloids. What you really need to understand about that is those compounds act kind of like nicotine. And so they cause an excitation and cause uh, tremors, and that is what we most likely will see in postnatal and adult animals. Now, it may get to the point that the animal tremors so much that you almost get into a paralysis, and initially that looks somewhat rigid, but then it looks flaccid. They're just paralyzed, and that's what we can see if an animal consumes enough of it, and again, there's been some discussion over how much of a problem it is in hay. Generally, the toxins are less toxic in hay, but there still is a significant risk, so we've got this, the intoxication that causes these animals to have tremor, nervous excitation, and then eventually paralysis, which causes death and paralysis involving the diaphragm and breathing. The next potential problem has to do with that the compounds in this plant, particularly in the early growth stages, are teratogenic. What does that mean? 
They cause birth defects in calves, in pigs, in sheep, and in goats. And in certain stages, it doesn't take very much to cause those adverse effects. And when they are a problem is generally in cattle during the first 90 days, the first trimester. And when we see in goats and sheep, pigs, it's roughly days 30 to 60 of gestation. And the problem with this is that you might not even know that there's a problem. The animals get into a very small amount of this plant. And again, even if it's in hay, and then what happens is when the offspring are born, they have multiple congenital contractures. But one of the things that people have described, they call it crooked calf disease, obviously, if it's a calf. And so when we have birth defects in some of our cattle, I generally think that this is the plant that probably is most responsible for that. So I hope that helps explain that in understandable terms. At first, we can have a lethal problem, but then we can also have birth defects associated with this plant.